Well, I hope you're ready for our next chapter in Ralph Moody's Little Bridges, which we are reading here at the Caribou Public Library for our chapter book story time. Um, so we just finished reading chapter 12, which was about when Ralph went on his own with Fanny, their horse, to go find Two Dog and Mr. Thompson. And he helped their horse, Bill, when they got back. So chapter 13 is called We Go to an Auction. The second Saturday after I went up to Two Dogs, there was an auction at one of the ranches down in Bear Creek Valley. Father and mother were going to go and see if they could buy a good milch cow. While we were eating supper Friday night, they were talking about the auction. Mother wanted to buy some things for the house and some more chickens. She said she'd like to get a turkey hen if she could pick one up reasonably. Afterwards, they talked about what kind of a cow they would like. Mother said to be sure it was one with a heifer, ca a heifer calf and she hoped it would be a Jersey because they gave good rich milk. Then father said, don't you think Ralph ought to go along and help pick out the cow since he's earned part of the money? I was drinking milk when he said it and caught my breath so quick that I pretty near choked to death. As soon as supper was over, I rode up to the Kokorans on the fly to tell them that I wouldn't be there to herd the cows the next day. Mr. Wright was the auctioneer and they started off by selling furniture and pots and pans and things out of the house. Mother stayed there to see what bargains she could find, but father and I went to the corrals and barns to look at the stock. Mrs. Cocorn was in the corral, looking every cow over and feeling their bags, and Fred Altland and Jerry Alder were in the barn looking at the horses. Fred came out and stood beside us while we were looking at the cows. There must have been 30 of them. He put his foot up on the bottom rail of the fence, laid his arms on the top one, and rested his chin against it. Charlie, there are two or three pretty good cows there, he said. Why don't you buy that brindle over there cause that Liz Cacoran's looking at, and this big Holstein near us? They'd give you all the milk and butter the kids could handle. Father didn't say anything for a minute. Then he smiled at Fred. Did you ever hear of the fellow who could have, who could have bought Brooklyn Bridge for a million dollars only he was short $999,999.50. $999 Fred laughed and said, you can swing it all right, Charlie. I don't think those two are going very high anyway. Then he rumpled up my hair and said, I'm going to have a couple more hangs this year and you got spikes here to help you pay for them. I hear tell he's holding Liz up for the 35 cents a day now anyway. He said it loud enough so that she couldn't help hearing him. And then he laughed until you could hear him all over the place. Father just chuckled a little. Then he said, it isn't only the cost of, the, of two cows, Fred. I'm going to have to ration close if I have enough winter feed for three horses and one cow off that little patch of oats and alfalfa. Mrs. Kikoran got red as a beet when Fred laughed about me charging her 35 cents a day for herding her cows. But instead of going away, she started looking at cows nearer to us. And I think it was just so she could listen. Anyway, Fred let his voice weigh down and said, I can stop you on that one too. Soon as the cold weather sets in, I'll go to bailing all the alfalfa that I'm not going to feed to my own horses. There's always a lot of leaf and chaff stakes out when you hit bail alfalfa. It's too dusty for horses, but it's great cow feed. Liz will only give me a dollar and a half a ton for it and I'd rather sell it to you. Those cows would, would turn it into some damn cheap butter. Hmm, it was the hay part that convinced father. He left me to look at the horses and hogs with Fred and Jerry while he went back to the house to talk with mother. I don't know when I ever ate anything as good as we had at that auction. They had dug a big pit out by the windmill and built a fire on railroad ties in it the night before. There was a whole yearling calf roasting over the pit full of hot red coals. They had a windlass rigged, a windlass rigged up over the pit and the whole dressed calf was trussed on a turn bar. Whole man was a big walrus mustache, with a big walrus mustache, was turning the windlass and throwing handfuls of salt on the meat as it turned brown. You could smell it all over the yard and it made me almost drool. It was about noon when Mr. Wright finished auctioning off all the things from the house and the hens and ducks and turkeys. Then two or three men helped lift the roasted calf from over the pit and put it on a big heavy table. There were boxes and boxes of soft round rolls and two or three firkins of butter set out on another table. They brought out four or five butcher knives and put them on the table with the meat. Then they brought a wash boiler full of coffee from the house and pitchers of milk 
and pies and cakes and donuts. Everybody who could get near enough to the meat grabbed a knife and sliced off big wedges to put on the spit rolls, <laughs> the split rolls and make sandwiches. I was one of the first ones to get a sandwich. Jerry Alder put me on his shoulder and went through the crowd around the table like a short horned bull going through a pack of coyotes. I ate so much my stomach ached, clear up to my wishbone. As soon as dinner was over, Mr. Wright started the horse auction. There were some pretty good horses and Fred paid more than $100 for one of them. He was a three-year-old bay and almost as big as old Jeff that I had rode to pull the stacker. Everybody stood out in a circle in the yard and they led the horses out one at a time. Before anybody bid on it, the man who was having the auction came out into the circle and told about the horse. He would tell how old it was and how long he had owned it, how well it would pull and all kinds of things. It was one that he had raised from a colt. Oh, if it was, he would tell which mare was the dam and what stallion the colt was after. Every time he finished telling about a horse, he'd pat it with his hand and say, sound as a nut. We couldn't be buying any horses, so we stood at the back of the circle. I guess the horses were all bringing more money than father and mother had thought that they would because I could see them keep looking at each other every time the bidding was above $50. After a while, mother whispered, with horses selling at that kind of price, the cows will probably be outrageous. We do hope there'll be one cheap enough so that we can afford her, but we'll have to have money for groceries this winter. I was standing on father's side and couldn't hear what he said when he turned his head to whisper to her, but she didn't watch the horse auction anymore. She just kept looking down at the ground. In a little while, she leaned over close to him and said, I'm afraid I spent more than I should have on things for the house, but there were some lovely bargains. Then father sent me, a, sent me to look at Fred's new horse while he and mother took a little walk. I had drunk so much milk with my sandwiches and donuts that I had to go awful bad. So Fred took me around by the cow corral while they were auctioning off the last horse. While I was busy, he went over and talked to the man who had been leading the horses out to, to the ring. They were looking at the cows when I got back and I saw Fred slip a silver dollar into the man's hand when he turned away from the corral. Father and mother had come back and we stood right in, front, in the front row for the cow auction. Father stood next to mother and then came me, then Jerry and Fred and Mrs. Kikorin. Mr. Kikorin had to stay home and herd the cows. They brought me, they brought out one cow after another and they sold for anywhere from 30 to $50 a piece. One or two old skinny ones sold for a dollar or two under 30, but the man who was having the auction bragged about every one of them. I kept watching for the two cows that Fred had pointed out to father, but I didn't see them. Wasn't too sure I could have recognized the Holstein because there were 10 or 12 black and white cows sold. There was only one, only the one Brindle in the corral, so I knew I wouldn't miss her. Mrs. Kikorin bid on almost every cow, but she always stopped when the bidding got up to 30 or $35. It seemed as though they must have brought out all the best cows first, or else everybody got cows who wanted to pay lots of money for them. Because when it was getting along toward the last, nobody was bidding much over $30. I thought sure that they'd come to the end before the man Fred had been talking to had let out the big holsting. I knew her the minute he led her into the ring and poked father on the leg. Mrs. Kikorin stepped right forward a foot when the man led the Holstein in, and she bid $20 for, for her the first crack out of the box. Father said, 21. Somebody else said, 21.50. Then Mrs. Kikorin yelled out, $25. I knew she was going to bid more than we could pay, and I hung my head down. I think that I was saying a little prayer that she'd stop at 30. When I saw Fred Altland step right on her foot, she jumped and glared around at him, but she didn't bid on the Holstein cow anymore. Father said, 25.50. And somebody said, 26. But we got her for 26.50. Before they let out the brindle cow, Mrs. Kikorin had moved down the circle away from Fred. She yelled, $25 before the man was through telling how good a milker the cow was. I was watching her and I didn't notice Fred moving down there too until he came right up beside her. I guess I wasn't the only one who saw him step on her foot that time because some young fellow on the other side of the ring called out, get her again, Fred. Everybody started to laugh and Mr. Wright yelled, sold, just as soon as father said, $26. I helped father harness Bill and Nig back to the wagon while Fred and Bessie Altland helped mother collect the things that she had bought. 
Father let me sit on the back of the wagon and lead our new cows home. He seemed happy while we were loading the things into the wagon, but Mother didn't say much. She had her lips buttoned up tight, and her face was bright red. On the way home, she talked most of the time, though. I couldn't hear all that she said because the Holstein cow held back on the rope, but I did hear enough to know that she had spent more than she thought she should have. She said, I just couldn't let those lovely buff Orpington pullets go by at 25 cents a piece. And $2.50 does seem a lot of money to spend for two turkey hens, but Bessie says they're good foragers and will cost hardly a penny to feed. If I have good luck and am able to raise a brood of young turkeys, they should furnish us with some very inexpensive meat. And it's so nice to have a turkey for Thanksgiving. Then she said something about it probably not being necessary to spend the $2 for a chest of drawers for the girls' room, but it was solid walnut. The first thing that I heard father say was, that's a nice looking little cuckoo clock you've got. I looked around when father said that and saw the red run right up mother's neck. They both laughed and mother said, don't you josh me about that clock, Charlie. I know we didn't need it, but it looked so much like home and I just got bidding for it against Mrs. Thede and some other lady and I couldn't stop. Grace had seen us coming when we were half a mile away and all the youngsters came running up the road to meet us. She and Muriel and Hal, oh, had Hal by each hand and were almost dragging him along. I guess we all felt that we were kind of rich people to be able to buy all those things. Philip put his bid in right away to be allowed to herd our cows. <laughs> so it sounds like some of their neighbor friends were kind of taking care of them so that they could afford the cows that they needed at the auction. Well, that's it for chapter 13. We're done for today, but we'll see you next time. Have a great rest of your day.